At an early age, I found out that alcohol causes brain damage. I was a child, but I was already a somewhat lanky child, lanky and sarcastic, when I found that out. And in many ways, that was the first step that led me to becoming vegan, and that led me to really a very philosophical perspective on the world, and of being extremely critical of the culture I lived in. The excuses that were so commonly made in my culture, and the... Uh, the contradictions within the lives of all the people around me. If you live in a country like Canada or Scotland, two different countries I have lived in, um, you're surrounded by people who are living with brain damage caused by alcohol and who are voluntarily inflicting brain damage on themselves through alcohol. And you will also meet many women who are mothers who have inflicted brain damage on their own children by drinking alcohol while they're pregnant. And... Um, Years later, I guess when I was a teenager, I remember reading a scientific article talking about the fact that in Canada and countries like Canada, brain damage caused to infants through alcohol was a much more serious and much more widespread problem than HIV AIDS. But at that time, HIV AIDS was the focus of tremendous public education efforts, including special programs having to do with the small number of infants being born with serious health problems or with AIDS itself because their mothers were infected with the disease. And this article was saying, yes, in some countries, HIV AIDS is a bigger problem, but actually, perhaps a country like Canada is engaging in a sort of self-deception because HIV AIDS is actually easier for us to talk about, easier for us to reflect on, easier for us to moralize about than the role that alcohol has in so many of our lives. Now, I myself drink zero alcohol. I made that decision at a pretty early age that I was not going to drink alcohol. But I did have a couple of years of drinking in my, my teenage years. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that I live in a society where I'm surrounded by people for whom alcohol shapes their lives profoundly. Uh, alcohol dominates the social time, the free time, the, the concept of relaxation itself, the concept of leisure, the concept of work what motivates people, what rewards people, the way people interact, the way people make friends, meet their lovers, learn to respect each other, learn to love each other, learn to reconcile their differences. All of those things in Western culture are shaped by alcohol use. And all the while, alcohol use very literally causes brain damage. It causes brain damage to the adults who drink it, and obviously there's this other issue haunting our society of how many millions of people have impaired brain function every day of their lives for the rest of their lives because their mothers drank alcohol before they were born while they were in the womb. Um, I have watched and listened to some documentaries that were brutally honest about those facts where you had people who themselves had brain impairment because of their mothers drinking alcohol, reflecting on the ways in which it changed their lives. It doesn't just, you know... <laughs> reduce your wattage, like dimming the intensity of a light bulb. It doesn't just in some simple mathematical sense make you less intelligent. Of course it impacts your emotional character. It impacts what kind of person you are in a way that's difficult for us to describe, difficult for us to reflect on, difficult for us to admit to ourselves. And again, it's hard to deal with on a one-to-one -one basis of perhaps you and your own brother. And it's much more difficult to deal with when you scale it up socially to think about millions of people and the impact it has, or if you think about people who are in positions of tremendous political power. People like the President of the United States, Prime Minister of England, who may themselves have seriously impaired brain function due to these common culturally accepted factors, the things so many of us make excuses for, so many of us say we should compromise about, so many of us say we should just be uh, moderate and reasonable about like alcohol causing brain damage. Now I say for me in my personal progression towards becoming a vegan, finding out that alcohol caused brain damage and then reflecting on the excuses that were so commonly made for it being normal and natural and necessary, that has striking parallels to finding out that um, meat is not only unnecessary for human health, but is actually damaging to human health. And then seeing the excuses the people around me made that meat was meat consumption was normal and natural and necessary. And that we had to accept this. This had always been part of our culture. This had always been part of our civilization. And again, meat like alcohol 
it has these you know tremendous cultural values ascribed to it meat you know it's linked to celebration to you know, concepts of generosity it's linked to all kinds of religious rituals even if you think something like thanksgiving or christmas are not that religious the ceremonial eating and sharing of meat these are powerful tokens in uh, western culture western civilization uh and for me there's a very real parallel and, and there's a there's a parallel with the powerful role of scientific knowledge in contrast to cultural assumptions when you look at those two now culture masks the significance of science in our lives in many ways and one of them is simply the use of language itself if you think about the word heart attack or the word stroke the medical use of stroke this seems to suggest a single event that happens in a short span of time at one moment in your life and either it happens or it doesn't it's very common to read newspaper articles or to talk to ordinary people even to talk to medical doctors who discuss um, heart attack and stroke as if they're a roll of the dice as if you can go through your life uh, eating a diet that includes bacon and uh, cheese and so long as the plaques develop in your arteries in a way that doesn't result in heart attack or stroke, you're lucky, you're fine, there's no harm done. Um, the idea that a heart attack is just something that happens at one moment, it's built into the very word and content of a heart attack. The concept of a stroke, it actually, the, the reason why we use the word stroke comes from the phrase, a stroke of the hand of God. And if you go back 500 years or so, that was actually the long form of this, at that time, mysterious medical condition of people having a stroke, that this was an act of God that suddenly took away your ability to think or use your limbs properly, uh, etc. The symptoms of strokes are, are various. Not everyone has the same symptoms, but it's a dramatic and horrifying uh, medical condition. Um, even on a more simple level, if someone asks you, if a child asks you, what is a stroke? you have to say it's a type of seizure. And if you look into why the word seizure is used, this comes from seize, to grab something. This again, ultimately the ancient idea is of a spirit seizing you, of you being possessed by a demon or a spirit. And again, the idea that this is something that happens in one moment. It's actually more horrifying in a more subtle and profound way to realize that these problems, like atherosclerosis atherosclerosis a word that even i've heard real medical specialists mispronounce atherosclerosis it's difficult to say it's difficult to understand what it is the reality is that the underlying conditions that really unify um, stroke and heart attacks such as atherosclerosis which is basically having plaques obstructions build up in your bloodstream in the circulation of your blood this is a problem all the time and for the vast majority of people in a country like the United States of America, it's not just a problem in your old age. It's not just a problem when you have a heart attack. It's a problem from when you were six years old until the day you die. Because six-year-olds in America eat bacon, eat cheese, have a diet that causes atherosclerosis, that causes so-called hardening of the arteries. Again, is that description really useful? That causes these plaques to build up that obstruct the flow of blood through your whole body. Now, what's much more horrifying to realize, again, heart attack describes something just centered in your heart. Stroke, it's even more nebulous and abstract. Where is a stroke? What is a stroke? What does this mean inside your body? The reality is that atherosclerosis is something that happens everywhere, that you have blood circulating. It impacts your toes, and it impacts your eyes, and above all else, it impacts the circulation of blood inside your own brain. In a subtle and profound and pernicious sense, the plaque in your bloodstream, the accumulation of cholesterol-related blockages throughout your body, impacts who you are, how you think, how you feel, in a way that's much, it's just as invidious, it's just as scary and disturbing to think about, as having to reflect on whether or not you are a different person today because your mother drank alcohol while she was pregnant with you or perhaps your mother was addicted to cocaine during her pregnancy. I have met and spoke to one man who had to live with that. He knew for a fact that his mother was addicted to crack cocaine during the pregnancy and he did have uh, symptoms. He did have health problems as a result of that. 
I have met many more people for whom alcohol impacted their lives in those ways. And one member of my own family was severely retarded, severely mentally disabled for his whole life because of choices that his mother made during the pregnancy. Um, so these things do touch us all. Um, they touch me in my life. But it's also scary to reflect the extent to which non-diagnosed conditions all around us are shaping who we are, how we live, how we think, and how we feel. Um, <laughs> in a profound and simple sense, what we call Alzheimer's disease is atherosclerosis. Alzheimer's disease is an extreme condition where the blockages, the impaired circulation of blood within your brain is having severe symptoms. But long before you reach the point where you would be diagnosed for that condition or where any kind of diagnostic medical test would be performed on your brain or on your arteries, the blockages, the hardening of plaque, the effects of cholesterol in the human diet will be changing the way how you think, the way you feel, the way you perceive the world. This is not a spectrum condition, but in the same sense in which you may never have a heart attack. You may eat bacon and cheese every day, live to be 100, and then be hit by a bus. However, even if you never have a heart attack and you never have a stroke, the reality of how the blood is circulated through your heart, through your muscles, through your body, will be impacted 24 hours a day, 7 days a week at all times by the blockages in your bloodstream, which is basically what we call atherosclerosis. And the connection between cholesterol and atherosclerosis is not debatable. It's now one of the simplest, most universal medical facts. The connection between atherosclerosis and what we call Alzheimer's disease was already documented in the first article by Dr. Alzheimer on this subject describing what it was in the human brain. Okay. Um, the point is, even if you never reach that point of having a diagnosed condition such as Alzheimer's, who you are, how you think, and how your brain operates is being impaired by the cholesterol in your diet. And again, when you scale that up, when you think about it on the scale of millions of people around you, that's when it really becomes terrifying in the same sense that the social impacts of drinking alcohol become truly terrifying. I did research not too long ago, uh, less than two years ago now, uh, about the period of World War I, uh, the history of Russia and Asia during the presidency of Woodrow Wilson. When I was looking in detail at the decisions Woodrow Wilson made in relation to a certain set of political problems, I didn't just think that his decisions were inept or incompetent. I actually thought that this man was insane. And I was reading, you know, direct U.S. diplomatic corps wires, communications between the United States and Japan at that time, communications between the United States and Russia at that time, that of course have been recorded for, for history. Um, and then I started to look into the health of Woodrow Wilson. I'll provide a link to one website uh, below this video. It's actually not unreasonable to say that Woodrow Wilson was, in a technical sense, insane. And Woodrow Wilson's health conditions... Uh, the deterioration of his brain, of his ability to think coherently, were of course linked to stroke, and the basis for the strokes, plural, that he suffered is doubtless atherosclerosis. Now, there's another stereotype here that Woodrow Wilson is important and challenging. Throughout his whole career, Woodrow Wilson, he was never a fat man. He was rail thin. He was strikingly thin. He had gaunt cheeks. If you look at most photographs of him, don't look at the paintings that are flattering. He is much leaner than most male models. He was a very lean man. Uh, but nevertheless, the meat and dairy products in his diet impaired his ability to think. They caused him to have uh, paralysis in some of his limbs at different times. Uh, at one point in his life, he went blind in one eye. When the blood in your brain does not circulate properly, it results in these kinds of very real impairments in how you think, how you feel, your ability to use your limbs, and so on. And Woodrow Wilson is a remarkable example of that. However, he's an extreme example. The question, what we'll never know, is when you look at someone like Donald Trump, right now in 2016, Donald Trump could become the next president of the United States. 
Donald Trump has cholesterol problems. Donald Trump takes uh, medicine to lower his cholesterol levels. Medicine's called statins. And uh, he believes he has his cholesterol under control. If you're vegan, you're in the tiny minority of people who truly have your cholesterol under control because you have zero dietary cholesterol. Your body generates its own cholesterol. Um, Donald Trump has never had these extreme symptoms that Woodrow Wilson has. To my knowledge, Donald Trump has never gone blind in one eye. He's never had his hand paralyzed. He's never had the obvious signs of stroke and of um, these atherosclerosis-related health problems, circulation of blood in his body and brain. However, he certainly has a very well-documented history of aberrant behavior, of um, incoherent and arguably somewhat insane thinking and speech and conduct. In the last 15 years, if you were to look back on how Donald Trump's behavior has changed, how his character has changed, because that's he's been on television since the 1980s almost continuously. His mannerisms has changed in a very real sense. Who he is has changed. One of the remarkable things about Donald Trump, and I, I believe him on this, Donald Trump says that in his whole life, he's never used alcohol, he's never used drugs of any kind. He's been clean and sober, and he has various emotional and intellectual reasons for why he did that. So we may be looking at an instance in Donald Trump where you see the deterioration of his faculties, the deterioration of his thinking. And the basis for that is perhaps not even an extravagant diet, perhaps simply a standard American diet where your levels of uh, cholesterol and your body's long-term struggle with atherosclerosis is impairing and degrading your brain function. I think our very idea of what it means to grow old, of what kind of sanity, mental alacrity, sharpness is normal for someone at 50 years of age, how much learning you're capable of at 30 years of age. In a profound sense, our idea of what it is to be an adult in this culture has been shaped by our broad-based use of alcohol, cigarettes, cholesterol in our diet, and the degradation of the human capacity to think and feel, the reshaping of who we are um, through what we put in our bodies. And the reality is that that very basic insight or that very basic concern I've just expressed to you was not possible um, just a few generations ago. It was only po made possible through the progress of science in the last few decades. And still today, many people will respond with shock and horror if you raise these issues. The same way that during my childhood, people would be shocked and horrified if you talked openly about women drinking alcohol during pregnancy. And still to this day, I meet women who drink alcohol during pregnancy. Uh, when my own wife was pregnant, I'm now divorced, but when my own wife was pregnant, we met and talked to medical doctors and other people, and the medical doctors would also complain that they still had patients coming in who were drinking alcohol all the way through their pregnancy, who were ignoring. It, it, this is a real ongoing problem in Canada, in France, in Scotland. And it impacts humans as individuals, and ultimately it shapes and reshapes our whole society. Uh, but the perspective I've shared with you in this video in many ways would have been impossible uh, just a few generations ago. It would have been laughed at one generation ago during my childhood. But the increasing availability of scientific research, the increasing ease with which we can read, at least in English on the internet, real peer-reviewed sources in which we can confirm our concerns about these things, um, that will now inevitably change the world again. It was very difficult for people to admit at one time, you look at the history of cocaine, that cocaine was poison. There was a time when people thought cocaine was a miracle cure. It was very hard for us in Western civilization to admit that tobacco was poison. You have to go way back, centuries and centuries ago, but there was a time when we believed nicotine, when we believed tobacco was a miracle cure for all kinds of things, including deafness. They used to put tobacco in people's ears and so on. It was ridiculous. But many of these drugs, when people first encountered them, there was reckless optimism. And, you know, the belief that meat and alcohol are so much a part of the meaning of our lives, of what we do with our leisure time, of who we are as people. That's become a crutch that all of Western civilization hobbles along on. And I'm looking forward to the day when we stop making excuses, put the crutches down, and when we truly get to see what we're capable of as adults.